quick warning this episode does cover some very disturbing and violent material so viewer and listener discretion is advised hello and welcome to weird wessex my name is craig and i'm andy so in 1974 in osset in west yorkshire is that we... that's in north wessex right north north wessex like proper far north wessex i reckon (laughs) for the purpose of today police were called to a naked man roaming the streets covered in red paint an inquisitive officer approached him uh he was screaming about the devil but on the arrival of getting close to this uh this guy who was naked walking around covered in this red paint screaming it turned out it was not paint at all but blood i just want to go (laughs) <laughs> yeah um have you ever seen friday night dinner it's so much blood it's so much blood it's paint jim it's so much paint um yeah great clip and i'll be honest right i've said this for a long time but mark heap is an underrated actor everything he's in he is genius originally i only watched friday night dinner for mark heap fair guy's I a legend really- I didn't really know any of them much apart from that guy from in between us. So, oh no, he was like you watched Spaced back in like the nineties oh, with Simon course. Pegg. Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, Green Wing. Oh, that's Dr. Alan Statham. That's going back. He used to walk around with the the megaphone, just going knob. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. Um... Yeah, I need to go on a binge now. But um, I feel like with such a dramatic beginning, complete with a, uh, you know, sort of a live reenactment of what the scene probably looked like, we, we, we've we probably got us uh, ahead of ourselves a little bit. So maybe we should go back to the beginning. <clears throat> All right. So in 1974, which was actually the year The Exorcist was released in theatres. It was. Um, I've actually got a confession about The Exorcist. Oh. Everyone loves The Exorcist, scariest film sort of of all time, I think a lot of people would say. I thought yeah. it was boring. Oof. Oof. You know what, though? You've got to put this into context. You know, back you, know, you back then, back then, you know, people's mindsets were different. They'd not seen anything like that. You know, you had people fainting in theatres and... You know, people thinking they'd been possessed from just going and seeing the thing. But... It might be that when I was 10, I was watching like Nightmare on Elm Street and Child's Play. I was too. My dad threatened to prop my eyelids open if I wouldn't watch the horror films with him. So, yeah, I think, I don't know. I, I, the, at least at the time, I haven't watched it for a long time. Maybe I should go back and have another look, but I did find it boring. So last time I saw it actually was in a... It was in Edinburgh, and it was in a cave in a pub. They have a cave down in the pub, yeah. so there's a load of tunnels in the pub because there's a lot of forest sort of rock there with you know sort of load of caves there. And they'd actually made this chamber in the pub. Um, a they turned it into a little cinema, like seats, like you know cinema yeah. seats and everything. And they they played horror films. And um, I'd gone in there with my. We were up there for a wedding. We'd just got back from the wedding and decided to go out for a few drinks before we went back to the hotel with my girlfriend yeah. and we were about to leave the pub and I just noticed that was on and just kind of rubber necked and I, you know we we didn't get back to the hotel room for like another hour and a half I'm like no we, we, we'd stayed and watching The Exorcist I, love that. I get what you mean it's not that scary it's slow moving to an extent but you know I think it's a pretty it's a pretty good film you know I think it's it was groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, yeah, it was. Anyway, back on track. So, as we said, 1974 in the town of Osset, West Yorkshire, lived a 31-year-old butcher named Michael Taylor, and he lived with his wife, Christine, and their five children. Um, the Taylor family lived in a small home, and neighbours described Michael as being mild-mannered and generally kind. However, it was later said that he suffered from depressive episodes. He would become withdrawn, refuse to interact with family and friends. um, And this was possibly caused by an injury that had prevented him from being able to work and it caused chronic back pain. Add to that financial strain, 
that the UK was under at the time um, yeah. with the depression. Um, and many people were only doing three day weeks, if at all. Um, so yeah, the guy's under a lot of pressure. So they'd never really been a religious family, um, not regular churchgoers or anything, but a neighbor of theirs, Barbara, who was religious, thought that this funk that Michael was in might have been due to him not having any sort of higher power looking over him or no spiritual path. And so she suggested that the pair come along to her local church. Now this was St. Thomas Anglican Church and they had like a relaxed weekly prayer meeting uh, in different members' homes, uh, you know, over tea and biscuits. So by the end of their first meeting, uh, Michael and Christine, uh, they were already joining in, talking in tongues. Um, and they were converts, you know, they, they, they got very into it um, and just, yeah, really embraced church life. Um, they were enthusiastic churchgoers and they were both baptised shortly afterwards and afterwards they would attend regular prayer meetings and offered up their own house for these meetings as well. Um, Do we need to tell people just in case Belt and Braces approach is in case anyone's wondering what talking in tongues is? Yeah, I mean, c could you do some for us? He's the rotalabakasi. Yeah, so, and there's there's variations on how it comes across. I think everyone kind of uses their own dialect, if you like. Then I don't think I've heard two that are the same. Um, so I, I used to go to a church youth group, um, and I never, I was never really religious, but my um, my friends were. And they used to go to this Easter, it was a Baptist church, and they used to go to this Easter camp thing uh, held at a holiday park. And apparently they'd all sort of go in, the older kids would go into this room. The young ones would just do activities with a bit of prayer. The older ones would go into this room and they'd read Bible verses and they'd all start speaking in tongues. And this guy, Steve, was like insisting to me, I know you really felt the power of the Lord, you really felt it. And, uh, you know, how people would like you know, they'd feel God with them and they'd just all start speaking in tongues. It's like, we could all understand each other and we're seeing it really, really fired up about it. Um, I was I was trying to convince him that you got that kind of feeling when you went to a gig and you can't really understand what the band are screaming, but you're all really into it. He didn't really agree. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, it's, uh, it was one of the things that at the time kind of made me decide not to go along to the church stuff and just keep going to the youth group. I think the church, one of the churches we used to go to, they didn't, I don't remember them doing the tongues. They used to do the, um, putting the hand on the head and people. Oh, like backwards. knock the devil out of you. Yeah, but without the slapping, just like, oh. Well, you're not doing it properly. <laughs> um, we used to go there for a while and then there were some rumours that they were talking about the devil too much, so we stopped going there. Ah. Um. Yeah, there was a funny thing is, is my dad wasn't necessarily a believer, but he said if my sister walked up because my sister got up once to go to the front, and he said if she falls over backwards, I'll believe, and she just stood there, <laughs> nothing <laughs> happened. <laughs> nice, Would, wouldn't go along with that. <clears throat> anyway, back to the story. Yeah, Michael and Christine's interest in the group appeared to be for different reasons, and it quickly became apparent that Michael was quite infatuated with the group leader. Described often as charismatic, Marie Robinson. Um, see, so Marie is not the sort of person that you expect when you think of a cult leader. And I use the word cult. I know there are church groups, so you could question that. But in some places, they get called a cult. That's a discussion for another day. Um, but yeah, I generally think more of Charles Manson or something when I think cult. You kind of got a bit of a... Thanks. <laughs> you know, I was I was at work once and someone actually said that to me. They went, you look like that guy. I was like, oh, who? And they're like, Charles Manson. Wow. Thanks. Yeah, I only just met the guy. So there is a story on one occasion where Marie, who doesn't have a massive amount of experiences, her position as a church leader, you know, bear in mind she is 22. Um, she's got no experience in exorcism, but she's asked to perform one or tries to perform one on an elderly lady named Mavis Smith, um, who'd complained of feeling a little low, and this was put down to needing exorcism, having demons inside her. There was a lot of beliefs that um, in these kind of circles that if you were depressed, if you had issues, anxiety, it was demons, multiple demons inhabiting your body. 
So this led to a bit of a scuffle between uh, the two. Um, so Mavis starts fighting back and Marie kind of just gives up on it. Now, and this was Michael Taylor's first glimpse into this side of the church and you know, probably looking back an early warning sign of things to come. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting side note as well, really, because Marie has no training in exorcism. She has no prior knowledge of how to perform one. She just decides she's going to do it. It's almost like she's trying to get a power grab. Maybe she's trying to rise the ranks quickly in the church by you doing something. You can sort of imagine it, can't you? Like, oh, this, this lady needs exorcism. I'll do it. You know, yeah. it's that sort of like, as you say, it's a power grab. It's a, you know, I'm going to put myself yeah, first and foremost here. And I, th I think we might get into that a bit more later, potentially. Um, yeah, about like how exorcisms work and stuff. There are some, there are rules in place, but we'll we'll cover that towards the end, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Michael starts to find solace in the regular meetings and a lot of his pains in his back and things start to, to dissipate. Um, and he feels like a lot of his problems are gone. So he spends more and more time with the group. Um, and it actually eventually leads to Marie offering private sessions for Michael. Um, and they would sit up all night making the signs of the cross at each other. I heard in one place that might be, it was something to do with the phases of the moon and they were trying to like reject evil by, by signing the cross all night to, to reject the evil from the moon. Um, that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, it's funny because this is around the time you've got the beginning of the satanic panic and also kind of a resurgence of Wicca and witchcraft and things like that, you know, on the back of the hippie movement in the 60s, you've got a lot of interest in the uh, esoteric and things like that. So, you know, I guess that's <clears throat> at the forefront of a lot of people's minds if you're that way inclined. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, their, their meetings and everything together, their one-on-one -on -one sessions didn't go unnoticed by the other members of the church. Uh, understandably, and in particular, was noticed by Michael's wife, Christine. Everyone seemed well aware that Michael had fallen in love and was actually probably obsessed with Marie. And at meetings, he would often have his arms just draped over her, even when his wife was there. Oof. Yeah. So this came to the attention of someone else, uh, Barbara, our favorite curtain twitcher. Uh, no, nosy neighbor. <clears throat> <laughs> who at first, uh, she she was the one that first introduced uh, Michael and Christine to the group. Um, she suggests that Michael should confront the issue with the group. Um, so at one particular prayer meeting that was held at the home of the Taylors, both Michael and Marie were told to go upstairs uh, alone together and not come back down until they'd resolved whatever was going on between them. Um, Can you hear knocking upstairs now? It's just the ghosts. <laughs> yes, just the ghosts, exercising yeah. the devil. <laughs> um, but no, while they're in the bedroom, uh, apparently Michael, surprise, surprise, um, tries to kiss Marie. Um, she rejects him, and so Michael uh, returns to the rest of the group and, you know, trying to save face, I think, more than anything, says, yeah. we've had a divine intervention and is the victory for the Lord. So, you know, he got knocked back, but he, he tried to save a little bit of face from it. Um, this might have been fine if they left it there, but Marie goes and tells the group about Michael trying it on with her uh, and her telling him no um, and says that they've got very different feelings about each other and uh, yeah things changed a little bit after that didn't they yeah so at this Michael's demeanor changes almost you might say as if he's become possessed and he starts speaking in tongues which Marie obviously retaliates by also speaking in tongues. So they have this battle back and forth. Tongue battle! <laughs> They're speaking to each other in tongues, back and forth. Um, and then he lashes out at Marie quite physically. And there is a later quote that I found that she said, I suddenly glanced at Mike and his whole features changed. He looked almost bestial. He kept looking at me and there was a really wild look in his eyes. I started screaming at him out of fear. I started speaking in tongues. Mike also screamed at me in tongues. I was on the verge of death and I seemed to come to my senses. I knew that only the name of Jesus would save me. And I started saying over and over again, Jesus. And when Christine heard me calling on the name of Jesus, she started saying it too. And I believe firmly that I was only by, uh, that it was only by calling on his name that I was not killed. Um, yeah, at that point, 
they did. You know, it might have been invoking the name of Jesus. It might have been that this guy was getting very aggressive with a girl nearly 10 years younger than him and trying to strike at her. But the rest of the congregation uh, jumped on Michael and managed to restrain him and drag him off. Uh, later, he claimed that he had no memory of the event. Now, I just want to put in here that I know we were sort of iffy about saying if this was a cult and you're describing it as a cult um, rather than a church group. But to me, the fact that the Taylors went from not being religious at all. Yeah. And by the sound of it, not ever really being religious before to then going to the point where they're invoking Jesus's name when someone's getting attacked, when they're speaking in tongues and acting like that's just a regular, you know, that progression that fast because this all happened in a pretty you know sort of uh tight time frame um to me that that does scream something of indoctrination <clears throat> the only yeah the only difference between that and a cult is that they would be free to leave if they wanted to like this is true with cults there's always some tie that you can't leave yeah. they've got something on you or you know i mean at this like... point, maybe they did but <laughs> Yeah, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes. I have personal experience with that. Probably never going to listen to this, but my mother-in-law, was a she's a recovering Jehovah's Witness from just a couple know. of years back. Not time to go into the details of that one today, but she was a Jehovah's Witness. Um, yeah, we've referred to them as a cult many times because she lost all of her friends when she left. She had to completely disown everybody that was in that her That is something group. they'll do. They'll they'll just, if they if they remove it from <clears> that, if you renounce it or if they kick you out, um, that's it. You're dead to them. Um, and yeah. the order goes out, you know. Uh, my mum's, one of my mum's friends growing up was a Jehovah's Witness. Now, I don't know if you know this about them, but they're, not supposed to they take the not consuming blood or flesh very literally um yeah. to the point where they uh, yeah we all know that just means don't eat people but they take it as you can't have a blood transfusion or an organ donation yeah yeah they do so my mum's friend needed um a um uh needed uh, one of these interventions one of these medical interventions she wasn't allowed um Luckily, mm. she was old enough um, and just said, all right, guess I'm not a Jehovah's Witness anymore and left and is still alive because of that. So, yeah, no, mm. I, I get what you mean. Yeah. So uh, Marie now claims that Michael is possessed and needs to be exercised. Um, she decides not to do it this time, um, probably after her experience with uh, Mavis. So the vicar pays a call to the Taylor's house. Uh, Michael throws a claim right back at Marie, saying that she put the devil in him. Giggity. <laughs> um, the claim about Marie actually comes back later via the vicar's wife, who reports that Marie was a Satanist who had infiltrated the church to recruit members. She claimed that during one of Marie's strange one-to-one -one ceremonies, uh, she had caused Michael's possession directly herself. There are also rumours that she was a member of multiple religious groups and maybe even the leader of a satanic circle. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> um, so maybe Mike was right. Maybe he was, maybe he <sighs> was. Um, yeah. We'll let you guys decide that one. I, I think as well that she ne she would never... She never testified, I don't think. I, um, oh, I really? Think, I think that was an article in a later newspaper report where she made that claim. But there's also some speculation that she was just jealous of marie because there's this young woman that's making waves in the church and yeah i don't know kind of like earlier christianity in europe where you know sort of you got this power struggle between you know prominent church figures and they're sort of throwing accusations of being heathens or apostates or you know kind yeah. of at each other and yeah i, I see <clears throat> that play out on a smaller scale yeah so michael's behavior starts to become quite erratic over the coming weeks he starts lashing out his family and he starts whispering to himself as well um he also starts to throw out any religious items he finds uh, supposedly he gets really angry when he sees them um and he also becomes really obsessed with the phases of the moon which i guess comes back to those rituals i said earlier about they were yeah it's it is connected i think 
It's interesting. Is it the demons inside him at this point, or is it the fact that he feels very let down and rejected by this church group that he joined and now have all probably turned against him? Um, and the sight mm. of these religious objects anger him because of that, you know? Well, you've got this guy that's in pain and financial difficulties, doesn't know what to do. He finds a new group of friends, so he's got a new social life, a new lease of life yeah. from it. And then suddenly that's taken away from him so yeah or maybe it was the devil or maybe it was the devil we shall find out or will we <laughs> so yeah his um his neighbors find his behavior quite concerning noting that he wanders the streets shouting and spitting at people um and there's a, a quote i found quite interesting was we must all drink the milk the milk of human kindness oh <laughs> So, yeah. Um, but yeah, he stopped sleeping properly and all he and his wife can think to do at this point is just to pray. She got quite concerned about this. And so Christine returned to the church and they she takes Michael um, with her and Michael gives confession and uh, they offer him a minor exorcism. Now, a minor exorcism is something that I think any baptised church member can do and it's basically just praying for a divine intervention so any member of a religious community that's been baptized in the anglican church can um you know stand over someone and pray for god to come and help um, the tailors then get invited to dinner at the vicar's house where he proceeds to start smashing plates up on the floor when the vicar's cat comes in uh, Michael gets very angry he screams at the cat grabs it by the scruff of the neck and literally throws it out of the room and this was kind of the last straw, really, for this uh, this group led by the vicar. So they decide, I personally think, wrongly, to perform an exorcism. Um, they haven't really gone through all the proper route that they're supposed to for an exorcism. Um, they should have, you know, gone to medical professionals and things first for second opinion, that kind of thing. I think exorcisms are actually quite rare these days. Yeah. They don't um, really tend to, it's not like a first resort. It's usually check on someone's mental health first. Yeah. If that's not working, then potentially. Just to interject here, actually, um, I believe it was two or three years before, I think it was 72, the yeah. Church of England actually sponsored a um, an investigation into exorcisms and the practice of exorcisms. Uh, obviously different church, but um, the findings, cause I think they were kind of hoping almost to say, you know, you know, it was a religiously re led one, but they were hoping to kind of just mm. do away with them. Uh, the finding was that they still believe there was merit in exorcisms for places like desecrated spaces and things like that. Uh, so spirits inhabiting or demons inhabiting a space. However, when it came to the two people, they were very against exorcisms being performed on people. Their advice, their findings was that you should always seek a medical advice, go through medical channels, get mental health support, and mm. a very, very last option the very last option go to a priest and if so do it with medical professionals uh present none of which was followed here no no so yeah on the evening of october 5th 1974 michael is called to saint thomas's church where father peter vincent the anglican priest for saint thomas's aided by a methodist clergyman the reverend raymond smith call for michael to be restrained um I'm not sure whether Michael's willing at this point. Yeah, there's a lot of... I mean, it's not uncommon to be restrained during exorcism. You know, there's expected to be thrashing about. There's expected the demons to be fighting back. Um, you know, certainly when you ever see it on TV and any shows like The Exorcist, anything like that, they're yeah. all restrained. Um, but they are supposed to be... They're supposed to be willing because part of the thing exactly. about doing the confession first, they have to take confession before yeah. they do an exorcism. So... To me, this one seems like he wasn't game. This is yeah. against his will. Or he may have been game and <clears throat> then decided he wasn't. Yeah. So um, he begins thrashing, convulsing and spitting. And so they tied him to the floor of the church. Um, they then take a crucifix, they jam it into his mouth and they soak him with holy water. Um, what followed from this was an eight hour long exorcism where they even burned Michael's own personal cross. And by 8am, 
Everyone was extremely tired and in need of a cup of tea. I have exercised the demons. So, yeah, I mean, they burnt the person across. Apparently, they said it was tainted, you know, being in Michael's possession with everything that had gone on with him. Uh, they said it was tainted. At this point, Christine was at the vicar's house. Um, but at 3 a.m. when they realised this wasn't going to be over quickly, they told her to go back to her parents' house. Um, that's where she and the children had been staying uh, while all this is going on. Now, uh, for some reason, she decided um, she wouldn't. She'd go back to her own house. This might have been because she thought she'd sleep better there, maybe because she didn't want to disturb her parents and her children at 3 a.m. Uh, we're not really sure. So she went home and it was just her and the dog. Now, during the court case that followed this, one of the preachers involved would state that at this point they'd managed to exercise over 48 demons, uh, including incest, bestiality, blasphemy, lewdness from Michael. Uh, but he did say they left behind three. Now, these were given the names murder, violence and insanity. I find that interesting, too, because from what I know of exorcisms, names are really important. Yeah. By calling on their name, you can then call on Jesus to help you get this. That's demon it. Yeah, out of knowing the body. a demon's true name <clears throat> is supposed to be a very powerful thing, isn't it? And it's, it is actually claimed that they phoned the police and they'd informed them about the removal of Michael's 48 demons and that he had three left to go. I'm sure they. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> You're a copper. You're on the early morning shift and now, you get called. I've I did some calculations on this, right? Because my question is, you've got three left, you've done 48, oh, we're tired, we need a cup of tea. But why didn't they finish the job? 48 demons. I'm not a mathematician, right? But in eight hours, that's 16 an hour, or 3.75 minutes per demon. Well, it obviously wasn't a price job. It was obviously like they were getting a day rate, you know? So they're just yeah, logging it out for two days, get another day's wages. By that calculation, they had another 11.25 minutes and they would have finished. Mate, it's, uh, demons have different power levels, man. You know this. Maybe these were the stubborn ones. Maybe they knew this would take off. <clears throat> My other thought is that they might have been backtracking during the court case because a lot of these numbers and things came out during the trial. And uh, and so was it an excuse? There's like, oh, no, no, we, we just hadn't finished the exorcism. That's why it didn't work. At this point, they took Michael home uh, and they didn't know. Apparently, that Christine had already gone there too, and they told him to prepare for part two of the exorcism, which would come the next day, which they said <clears throat> they would finish the job and remove those last three demons. So during the trial um, that came later, Michael had said, and I quote, Look at my hands. I was banging on the floor. The power was within me. I couldn't get rid of it, and neither could they. They were too late. I was compelled by a force within me to destroy everything living in that house pretty iffy stuff you know <laughs> well i know what's coming so deep breath everybody we can do this Want my beer <clears throat> by 9 45 just an hour and 45 minutes after the exorcism police were called to a streaker roaming the streets covered in red paint and screaming about the devil but on arrival the paint turned out to be the blood of his wife christine taylor told the officer in attendance last night last night they primed me for it they filled me with the devil. I loved her. I destroyed the evil that was within her. The officer then asked whose blood was on him and he responded, the blood of Satan. Is Satan their dog? <laughs> we haven't given that bit away yet. <laughs> <laughs> So the officer that had found him, you know, this obviously, you know, you come up to this guy, you think it's pain, it's blood, he's spewing out this kind of, you know, sort of really scary stuff. So we rushed to um, Taylor's home. I think Taylor <coughs> was fairly forthright about where he lived. Um, and he only, uh, he only got there only to find police were already there. Uh, Neighbours, possibly Barbara. Um, had heard noises and the police had already been called. Now, the officer approached the house but was waved off by an exiting officer who came out very pale, very distressed looking. And again, this is a direct quote. You don't want to see this one, son. I've seen nothing like it before and I've seen a few. It's the wife. 
she's got no... He ripped at her son. It's a right mess in there. There's not much of a left. You don't want to see it, eh? After saying this, the man doubled over and vomited in the yard. Um, Michael had ripped out Christine's tongue with his bare hands. He gouged out her eyes and ripped the flesh from her face. The coroner reported that she had died of shock and inhalation of her own blood. He then strangled the family poodle. After the dog was dead, he ripped out its eyes and tore it limb from limb, throwing the limbs around the house. The house was covered wall to ceiling in blood. Michael was arrested. He never provided a motive for killing Christine beyond, and again, this is a direct quote, released. I am released. It's done. The evil in her has been destroyed. So at Michael's trial, his defense lawyer stated that the prayer group had exasperated an already cracking mind. He'd cast doubt on the possession theory by calling it neurotic speeding neurosis to a neurotic. Michael was found not guilty by reason of insanity and a clinical psychologist testified that his actions were a direct result of the intense psychological torment that he'd experienced the previous night. He received psychiatric care for four years, two in the high security Broadmoor and two more at Bradford Royal Infirmary before then being released. Um, Broadmoor is a pretty intense place to be sent. Um, I think that's the high security one of the two, right? Which is where yes. we went there first. Yes. Uh, Broadmoor is... Yeah, it's housed and does house some very prolific killers and rapists and all sorts of the wrong sort of people. Um, among the famous inhabitants or guests, um, you've got Peter Bryan, uh, Ronnie Cray, and the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, have all been there. Uh, Peter Bryan... <clears throat> For those who don't know, he was a serial killer. He killed someone, managed to get away with it, or I think he may have been imprisoned but then released. Uh, he killed someone else, and when he was caught, um, he was actually cooking a part of his victim. He was then taken to Broadmoor. Ten days after he was taken to Broadmoor, he killed his cellmate, I think it was, and started to eat them as well. So, yes, it's it's not a pleasant place. No. Um, none of the members of the church faced any charges um, in relation to the death of Christine Taylor. Um, according to the book, The Sussex Devil, uh, which is a very hard to get book, I think, isn't it? You were, you were saying it's... I've tried to get hold of it. If anyone can find a copy, then great. I believe most of the things we've we've done as much research as we can. And I think most people use that as the source. I think it's the most sort of thorough investigation, but it's not currently in print and it's out of stock everywhere um but according to this book the man in charge of the exorcism reverend peter vincent was actually promoted within the church the following year uh it's unclear whether this is a promotion he was due anyway or as part of his role and the work that he'd done with michael taylor which that seems <clears> a little <throat> bit <laughs> distasteful if it was due to that but i don't know these things work yeah yeah and i think he lived out the rest of his days and passed away a couple of years ago, I think I saw. I got very excited because um, I was trying to find a paper trail for him. Uh, I was trying to sort of, you know, find out more about his um, later life. And I found a Reverend Michael, uh, sorry, a Reverend Peter Vincent on LinkedIn. <laughs> and I thought there's no way this guy at that age uses LinkedIn and it was someone else. So yeah. please don't send him any hate mail. I've got a quote from Police Constable Ian Walker, who said, of all the incidents in which I was involved in 30 years of police work, nothing affected me like this. The stupidity and futility of it all, the complete and utter waste of life, destruction of a family, not to mention the death and other traumas are far beyond anything else I've ever come across. So Michael, I believe, is still alive. Um... Unclear. I did try yeah. to find out. He might have changed his name, I heard, from one place. Um, um, if he's alive, he would be 79 now. So, yeah, he might still be around. Um, he did return to court in 2005 and was convicted for inappropriate sexual contact with a teenage girl. 
Uh, in prison, he exhibited similar behavior to before, um, so was returned to Broadmoor for evaluation. Um, he was later released, and yeah, as far as we know, he's still out there, um, although it is also noted that he has tried to commit suicide several times. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think four is the official count on that one. Um, I didn't put it in our notes, actually, but it's probably worth mentioning that Marie kind of slinked off into the shadows. She got a sort of very normal job after this, wasn't involved with the church anymore. Um, and in at least one source was said that she moved to America. So she probably tried to completely get away from that life. Yes. But in theory, she should still be out there somewhere too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously uh, she would be um, in her early 70s now, 70, 71. How old was Michael in his 30s? He was 31, she was 22. 22, yeah, so she'd be in her 60s. Yeah, late 60s or so, yeah. Yeah, yeah so she could also still be around. Um, you um, would want to put it behind you, whether you had a worse play to part in it or were an innocent victim, either way. You, you probably yeah. would want to get far away from that, wouldn't you? You probably want people to forget about it. And then there's these stupid podcasters that just keep bringing it back up. Yeah, that's it. Just dragging it to the fore. Um, so in more recent history, and I was going to say lighter news, not really. Uh, no. But the case, the case is mentioned at the end of the 2021 film, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, which is based on another case with a killer who claimed demonic possession. Um, and it's about a guy who killed his landlord with a pocket knife in a fit of rage in 1981. Um, I'll be honest, as part of this, I did start to watch that film and I did get slightly bored. And I never finished it. Just to add to that, that is a unfortunate in some way side effect of um, having watched all those scary films or supposedly scary films when we're kids. No, I think the conjuring in general, I think they're overrated. Um, and I can't stand the way that they've portrayed the Warrens. I'm gonna say it. The Warrens are not like they are in the film. Uh what um, the uh the London one, the Enfield uh The Warrens are dicks, basically. Uh. I mean they they they're basically looking for film rights and money, aren't they? Uh. That's what it all came down to. As soon as all of that disappears, they fuck off and they leave a family in yeah, there's. A, I think that Emma watched a documentary about the devil. Maybe do it, and I'm pretty sure that it's quite explicit in that that you know the Warrens were only interested up to a point, and then once the family are fucked, they just go, "Nah, we're done. We've got what we need," sort of thing. And so you heard it here, Warrens. If you're listening to this podcast, your dicks. I think he's dead. Lady Warren. Well, I forget her name. Lady Warren, yeah, that's her. <laughs> if you're listening to this, you're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get a Ouija board and contact him. Um, if you if you disagree with this statement, come on the podcast and debate us. <laughs> I'm not even sure if she's alive now that we say I that. I think she's still alive. I think she's still alive. Look. See, if we were yeah. like a proper one, like Joe Rogan or some shit, we'd have someone like in the corner, just not that I'm a massive fan of Joe Rogan, but like we'd have someone in the corner just researching this for us and shouting the right answers. You to know, it. like there's no reason that we can't do that and edit this. I mean, we could. We've no, just no, we need to. someone in the corner. We need someone in the corner. Get Emma on it. <laughs> Look, or if you want to be our person in the corner, get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> Although we are in different rooms, so we're going to need two elves, one in my corner and one in your corner. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they should just like hover in the shadows by your bookcase. <laughs> yeah, just poke their head up now and then. <laughs> um, so I did say to you before we recorded as well that the reason that I found this story to begin with... It was another um, case, wasn't it? It was another case, so it's, it's not one that would have a whole episode to itself but is a guy called john jenkins from Millam in cumbria and he was jailed for life for using an axe to hack his mother and sister to death the night before the murders he had said i am the devil and i need to confess he'd actually only been released from a mental health unit two days before and had schizophrenia 
He told police he killed his mother because she'd become controlling and aggressive after he tried to commit suicide. Um, and he went on to say he'd hit his mother with lots of blows to the head. And then when his sister came down the stairs, he attacked her to stop her from screaming. Um, he made some other claims later as well about he claimed he'd had sex with his sister and things, but they reckon there's no evidence for any of that. Only the two murders. Um, yeah. yeah, it's another horrible case. That is, that is. Um, well, on that bombshell, I yeah, uh, I guess we're over to weird news. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention is that I think at some point, because obviously we need to do something lighter. We've done some darker stuff the last yes. couple of episodes. Um, but at some point, I think we should return to the devil, but we should do the devil in folklore, who is usually quite fun. He's easy to trick. Um, yeah. He, he, he like, buries towns under rubble, that yeah, kind of thing. Having having games that end up with standing stones hanging around, you know, throwing rocks places. and Yeah. I prefer that devil. So like, maybe at some point we should do that. Likes people that run around trees 10 times at midnight. Um, things like that. Yeah, you know, seems like a strange but all right guy in those. But no, definitely we, we need to return to the devil on that one. Uh, yeah, mm. bit of old Nick. We'll call the episode Return of the Devil. Return of the Devil. Uh, yeah, so you sounded quite keen for weird news. So what you got for me? Um, so we'll have a pause here because I really need a piss. Yeah. Keep this in if you like. I don't care. <laughs> I'll keep it in. I'm gonna entertain the audience whilst you're gone. Do um, it. I'm gonna get gonna get my knob out. <laughs> <laughs> like that current abbot's join. Yeah. So yeah, we do actually. Yeah, I could tell everybody about that. Don't do you that. Probably... That's what you reveal. I'm revealing it now. Don't reveal it to anyone, you pervert. <laughs> So we have a new logo, which you've probably already seen on social media, and it's the Kern Abbas Giant. So we are going to at some point soon try and do an episode on chalk figures. Um, yeah, symbols from Wessex, that kind of thing. Did you hear any of that? No, I don't mean I don't listen anyway. Good. Wait till <laughs> the episode comes out. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, you don't listen either. So. <laughs> I do, occasionally. If it's one where I talk lot to do. Yeah, I'll probably cut me mumbling onto people, but I did just mention that we were going to do um, something about the Kernabas giant chalk figures, stuff from Wessex, symbols. Yeah, the we symbols! Do, we do need to pull it back to Wessex. We were in Wessex today. We did all that stuff in Yorkshire and Cumbria. Very, very far north Wessex. Okay, so... We need to do something in South Wessex, you know, the Wessexy bit of Wessex. All right, all right. Look, let's let's do a quick history lesson. In 1066 in the Battle of Stamford Bridge, who won? The King of England. The, the Saxons. The Saxons. Now, if they'd gone on to win Hastings, Yorkshire would have been in Wessex. That's my argument, and I'm sticking to it. Well, I mean, I guess <laughs> you, what you could say is at one point, Harold ruled... Um, Harold ruled Yorkshire, Northumbria, because he was the king of England, right? Yeah. Now, he started off as not the king of England, but the Earl of Wessex. Therefore, the Earl of Wessex <laughs> went on. That's it. We got it. We got it. Right. No, right. Um, I think we've had this discussion many times. People are probably bored now, but, you know, we we don't have to just do Wessex. We're called Weird Wessex because we live in Wessex. Yeah. This is weird news. So... Weird news. What um, you got? Do you want to go first or shall I? I feel like I always go first for weird news, but I, I could go first again. So, Andy, pick a number from one to four. Three. So, Florida man sues Dunkin' Donuts for $50,000 in damages after claiming an exploding toilet left him covered in human feces. Wow. So, Paul... Ooh. Kuriak, I think is how you say his name. He claimed in 2022 he suffered severe and long-term injuries after the toilet exploded in the men's room at Duncan's store in Winter Park, Florida. Is it Duncan's store? Because I said Duncan Donuts earlier. I'm assuming it's a Duncan Donuts store, but yeah. Maybe they're not called Duncan Donuts anymore. Oh well. 
Um, yeah, Kuriak said both he and the interior of the room were, quote, covered with debris, including human feces and urine following the incident. After leaving the room, he said he tried to get help from staff at the store and was told that they were aware of a problem with the toilet as prior incidents with the toilet had occurred. Um, the lawsuit goes on to say that Kuriak is now in counselling and requires mental health care due to the trauma he experienced. It says he suffered bodily injury and psychological damages resulting in pain, suffering, disability, permanent and significant emotional injury, mental anguish, loss of the capacity for the enjoyment of life, expense of medical care and treatment. He is seeking $50,000 in damages, not including additional costs, interest or attorney fees. Uh, ah, this explains what I just said. Duncan is perhaps better known under its former name, Duncan Donuts. Ah. The business rebranded in 2019 in an effort to transform itself into a beverage-led on-the-go brand. Uh, then it goes on to talk about Dunkin' Donuts, to be honest, which um, we don't need to do. Yeah, there you go. We're side there. note, from what I gather, Dunkin' Donuts coffee is quite good, so maybe that's why they made that choice. But back to the important thing, an exploding toilet. Hey, they're not paying us for a sponsorship here, so no. Their I'm toilets the donuts explode. Might be shit. I'm don't... not going to big them up for free. Um, Don't go into Dunkin' Donuts. Their toilets explode. I mean, how does the toilet explode? Like, what is a toilet that can explode? I presume that it's got some kind of pressure thing in it. You know, like when you're on a plane and it does that. They do it at um, service stations too, don't they? They're really yeah. loud. There that, must be yeah. something, it, but I don't know how that works or if that could explode. Yeah. If anyone that... out there knows how the toilets explode, let us know. Yep, yep, maybe we'll do a whole episode on it. I mean, that's that's horrific. I mean, you know, normally I'd be like, yep, Florida man story, suing them for lots of money. Of course he's saying that he's got all this trauma. But, you know, that would that, legitimately be very traumatic. Um, yeah, it's a bit shit, isn't it? Um, incidentally, I thought... Um, I, I'll, I'll cover this right at the end, actually. Um, I'll go to my weird news first. Okay. So we're going on brand for this one. We're going. Uh, we're going on uh, on topic for this one. Um, this is from the very reputable source of news, uh, the Daily Star. Um, and I actually got a photo of this. So I sent to you um, a week or so ago um, when I was I was lining up an Aldi's to uh, buy some. I don't know, ah, this one. Me. Yes, yeah. and I saw a headline. I was like, oh, my God, that's the weird news. Um, did you buy the paper or did you just... No, I didn't. I'm not going to buy the paper. <laughs> um, they're not They're not sponsoring us either. Um... Fuck you, Daily Star. <laughs> Andy, don't say that. How rude. <laughs> um, Pope's exorcist, who performed 70,000 exorcisms... Wonder how well they all went. Um, it says politicians are possessed by a devil. Uh, the Italian priest um, who died in 2016, I'm guessing this has only just come out, age 91, who is played by Russell Crowe in the blockbuster The Pope's Exorcist. Um, Father Gabriel Amorth, um, he said that evil exists in politics and the worst culprits were beyond his power of salvation. The Italian Catholic priest who died, it covers that again, um, in a recently unearthed interview with obscure Spanish magazine Maria Mensagera, uh, a.k.a. Mary Messenger, um, given shortly before his death, um, Father Amorth said politicians were most at risk from falling under the devil's spell. Um, he said evil exists in politics quite often, in fact. The devil loves to take over business leaders and those who hold political office. Hitler and Stalin were possessed. How do I know? Because they killed millions of people. The gospel says, by their fruits, you will know them. Unfortunately, an exorcism on them would not have been enough since they were convinced of what they were doing. Um, he said, we can't say it was a possession in the strictest sense of the word, but rather a total and voluntary acceptance from the suggestions of the devil. He said he could have performed many more exorcisms than tens of thousands he conducted because no one was safe from the devil. I tell oh. those who come to see me first, go to a doctor, a psychologist. He's got one up on the uh, guys up in Yorkshire, at least. 
Um, most of the time, there is a physical or psychological basis for explaining their suffering. Yet he still performed over 70,000 exorcisms. Mm. Um, he said, I work seven days a week from morning till night, including Christmas Eve and Holy Week. Everyone is vulnerable. The devil is very intelligent. He retains the intelligence of the angel that he once was. Um, <clears throat> wow. I mean, yeah, sounds legit to me. Yep. Um, the last bit says, suppose, for example, that someone you work with is envious of you and casts a spell on you. You would get sick. 90% of the case I deal with are precisely spells. The rest are due to membership in satanic sects or participation in seances or magic. If you live in harmony with God, it is much more difficult for the devil to possess you. So there you go. Um, yeah. I thought that was a nice sort of topical one for this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have inspired me to add a new potential segment to the show on occasion, though. Go on. Um, here's my pitch. Yeah. So you know what you do is you Google Florida Man and your birthday. Just the month and the day. Yes. And you find the Florida Man story uh, relating to it. I'm just going to give a quick example. What date is your birthday? Not the year, just the just the, uh, the just day the of the day. month. Twelfth of October. So twelfth October, Florida man. Consider this. All right. So the article that comes up when I write that, um, I'll just give you the title. I've um, only got one date of birth, so this segment's not going to work. No, no. Every hear, weekend, me out, hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Deputy, um, deputy cleared, or this is a Florida. But yeah, yeah. The title is. Naked Florida man cross with a crossbow who claimed aliens were after him shot deputy. Wasn't me. Weird news right there, you know. That happened in 2018, though. Um, I won't read the entire segment. If anyone listening wants to know, just type Craig's birthday and you can read that. That literally goes for anyone from what I've found. So I reckon if we have a guest on the podcast, we get their birthday and we read them their Florida man story. Okay. I've got a potential guest or two possibly coming up soon. So fantastic. Make sure you get their forward stories. I'm not going to mention it in case it doesn't happen, but hopefully we're going to have a good guest coming up. Um, yeah, that's quite a good segment. I'll, I'll give you that. Hey, there I'll you go. That. My yeah. one good idea of the month. Yeah. Go for a they had an idea, folks. <laughs> <laughs> So that is about it for us, folks. Um, we, I want to say that we'll do a lighter episode next time. Don't want to make any promises, though, but we'll see. <laughs> well, let, yeah, people let us know. I mean, I don't know whether you prefer the darker stuff or if you want something lighter. I think I need some lighter stuff, mate, to be honest. it's Okay. The, the so nightmares won't stop. <laughs> we got chalk figures, barrows, you know. Yeah, there, there'll be some lighter like stuff. And then yeah, we'll do some horrible, folklore stuff. The horrible will go back in after that. But um, yeah, so from us, uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, obviously, if you haven't done it already, please uh, like and subscribe on YouTube or anywhere you find your podcasts. Head over to our Facebook page. Uh, give that a like well as well. And yeah, just if you've got any suggestions, any stories you want us to cover, any stories of your own you want to share with us, please let us know. Until next time, guys, stay weird. <laughs> and me. 